I'm ready. All right, um, so welcome to our last AP World class today. Our admission year for the exam. Uh, I know it's very, very exciting. And uh, we will open it up uh, for questions. Now keep in mind, these are not only questions that you have, but the, the questions that you have are probably questions that my A-Day kids have. And who knows how many people around the world are going to be tuning in at some point to watch this. Not only this year, but next year, probably more than seven. Oh, um, my, that's my bad. I can't. <laughs> I'm a history teacher, not a math teacher. Um, so uh, who wants to start us off here? Yes, ma'am. Can we go over the um, Crusades again? Um, there's, uh, when it comes to content, there's not a ton that I, I really want to do right now. Um, so all I'm going to give you is like literally, what does an AP World student need to know about the Crusades? And I will go no deeper than that. So what does an AP World student need to know about the Crusades? It is an interaction between Europe and the Islamic world. It's happening in the, in the 12th and 13th centuries, the 11th and 1200s. And obviously it's, it's an attempt by, by Christian knights of, of mostly Western Europe to try to retake the Holy Lands, and they are successful for a little bit, but what's most important for AP World is just that interaction. It is what the Christians, what the Europeans are going to learn from the Islamic world when they come in contact with them. Um, and so it's, there's some of it's gonna be like a reconnection to old learning, better medicine, uh, better mathematics, better astronomy, all these advancements that the Islamic world had had, now Europeans are gonna come in contact with it. That's really it. You also want to recognize that for the Muslims, the Crusades were kind of like a fringe event. It wasn't that big of a deal for them. Um, and, uh, and it had much more impact long term on, on the, the Christian Europe. Uh, yeah, and, and you can feel free not to just stare at me the whole time. You can oh, move okay. around and. and yeah. Yeah. Show us. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I, I cannot go over the significance of each of the Chinese dynasties, except to say this, except to say this, if you know like one really important thing, at least, on each of those Chinese dynasties, you will be good to go. So uh, we're gonna go through really quickly and do one really important thing on each of the Chinese dynasties. You can't relearn history in one day or one hour, right? So here we go. We know the song. Shang Zhou Chin Hong. Shang Zhou Chin Hong. Sui Tang Song. Sui Tang Song. Wang Ming Ching Republic. Wang Ming Ching Republic. Mao and Dong. All right. Shang. Shang. They're the first. That's like the Chinese River Valley civilization. We don't know much about them. They had oracle bones. There was an early Chinese script. They're on the Wanghe River. That's all we know. Um, then we skip to the Zhou Dynasty. The Zhou has its importance, not in like what it did as a dynasty, but more as what it didn't do. It wasn't really all that centralized of a, of a Chinese dynasty. And it gets a guy like Confucius, who's just a mid-level bureaucrat in the uh, sixth century, to look around and say, we can do better than this China. And he starts coming up with better ideas about how to more effectively run a society. So Confucius lives during the state of Joe. I like to think of that kind of the same idea of the Enlightenment thinkers living in France, right? Enlightenment thinkers, Voltaire and Rousseau, uh, living in France and looking at the absolute monarchy of, of Louis the, the 14th or Louis the 15th and saying, we can do better than this and, and coming up with ways that will eventually be put into place. Uh, then the Qin Dynasty. The Qin Dynasty, that's what we consider the first Chinese dynasty. Qin Shi Huang, the unification of China, centralized script, a centralized language, building the Great Wall of China. That's the Qin Dynasty, that's why we call it China. Um, they don't last too long, harsh rule of law under the Qin. Remember we call that? Legalism, Legalism. very good. Uh, then we go to the Han Dynasty, and over time the Han Dynasty is gonna start bringing Confucianist ideas into its rule. So the Han Dynasty, that's the classical Chinese dynasty. 400 years from about 200 BCE, to 200 CE. I guess this is me actually talking a lot about each of these dynasties. Um, so uh, the Han Dynasty, 400 years, they're the ones that bring in Confucianism. That's gonna last for most of the next 2,000 years. Um, and then the Han Dynasty falls. And, and the AP exam is gonna ask you a question about the rise and or fall of empires. 
keep in mind the, the general um, internal and external reasons why empires rise, why empires fall, okay? Access to resources, access to weapons, things like that, they rise. Um, and peasant uprisings, corrupt leadership, outside invasions, they fall. The Han Dynasty falls, and we go through this period known as the, uh, the period of the Three Kingdoms, or the Three Kingdoms era. So basically, China is decentralized again until the Sui Dynasty puts them back together. Sui Dynasty is also remembered for uh, the construction of the Grand Canal, which is a great example of state facilitation of trade. What does a state do? What does a government do to make sure that there's trade uh, within its country? Build a Grand Canal. That's perfect. The Tang and the Song Dynasty, this is considered the golden age of Chinese history. It is where China is at its wealthiest. There's a lot of developments. There's a lot of urbanization, populations on the rise. Remember the importation of chompa rice from Vietnam. Whenever there's more food, there's more population. So that's the Tang and the Song Dynasty. Also in the Tang Dynasty, we start to see a pushback against Buddhism. Buddhism that had entered China centuries before and had grown into prominence in China, the Tang Dynasty, and the, the bureaucrats, the Confucianist bureaucrats, or guys that we're going to call Neo-Confucianists, they start to push back against Buddhism. Uh, because there are a lot of Buddhist lands that weren't being taxed by the government, so let's get rid of that kind of stuff. Um, so that's the Tang, Song and the Tang Dynasty. Yes, ma'am? Wasn't there like an empress that was like Buddhist? Empress Wu. Yeah. Empress Wu, yeah. Um, be careful with that, because there was also an Emperor Wu. Um, but he's not Empress Wu. Empress Wu is the Buddhist Wu. And right? that was the Tang Dynasty? Wu Tang. Wu forever. Wu Tang. Wu Tang. Yeah. <laughs> 1995, man. I, I, uh, that was kind of hardcore. <laughs> Beastie Boys. <laughs> you don't know about that, do you, Herman? Wu Tang Clan. The Riz of the Jizza. ODB, Inspector Deck, Raekwon the Chef, Method Man, come on. Okay, anyway, anyway. All right, now I've got enough street cred to get me through the rest of the day, and we push on to the, 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 uh, the Yuan Dynasty, the Mongol Yuan Dynasty in the, in the 1200s, 13th century, going to conquer the Song Dynasty. These are foreigners, a reason why empires collapse, outside invasion. That's what the Mongols do. The Mongols take a Chinese name, the Yuan, but they run the Chinese state now uh, with Mongol leadership. Um, they last for, for about a cent little less than a century even. Uh, and then the, uh, the Ming Dynasty replaces the Mongols. Uh, the Ming Dynasty, this is the, the dynasty of Zheng He. Why Zheng He? The Mongols were all about horses, overland trade routes, connecting east to west over land. And they kind of retracted from the sea a bit. The Ming are going to reestablish their dominance in the Indian Ocean uh, basin, right? And so Zheng He, his whole job is to go around and collect tribute for the Chinese dynasty. They didn't collect as much as they had hoped for. It wasn't really worth the expeditions. They trashed those ships. Uh, the Qing dynasty, to replace the Ming, the Qing dynasty. Uh, these are foreigners as well, kind of like the Mongols, redone, right? The Qing are Manchu, uh, so they're from the north, and they are going to topple the, the Ming dynasty in the mid-1600s. Um, again, this is a, a high point in Chinese history. They're bringing huge amounts of American silver into China from, from European merchants. Um, but by the time we get to the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution has happened in, uh, in Europe. European countries are certainly on the rise and now dominant, and a country like England defeats Qing, Di Qing Dynasty in China in the Opium War and forces the doors of Chinese trade open. Um, by 1911, after a couple of other internal issues, the, the Taiping Rebellion, the Boxer Rebellion, the Qing Dynasty is going to fall, and that's when we go to the Republican Age. The issue with the Republican Age, when there's no dynasty, is there's no more unified China anymore. So we got a lot of factions duking it out for who's going to have control. Ultimately, the, the winner of, of that long Chinese Civil War is going to be the Communist Party, led by Mao Zedong. Fast forward all the way to 1980s, and the new communist leader, Deng Xiaoping, and, and he's going to pop up maybe at the end of your test, a question about economic reform in China. Um, Deng Xiaoping, D-E-N-G. Um, he's the guy that allows Western businesses and enterprises to enter into China and take part in their economy. But he doesn't allow any uh, political freedom. 
So China reforms economically but maintains a harsh one-party communist rule politically. All right, that's enough for that. What other kinds of questions do we have? Not, um, don't be afraid to not ask about content. Uh, or, or I'm going to take over in just a little bit and talk about some of the, the, uh, the more bells and whistles aspects to this test. Yes, sir? Um, what was one of the, I kind of forgot, what was one of the main things that the Persian Empire accomplished? Persian Empire, if you know Zoroastrianism as the Persian religion, and Zoroastrianism is kind of important because of its, even though it's, it's today largely an extinct religion, there are a handful of Zoroastrians around, but it's, it's largely been overtaken in the region by Islam. Uh, but Zoroastrianism, uh, many theologians believe that there is a connection between the Jewish and then the Christian and Muslim concepts of heaven and hell, this like good versus evil conflict, and that, that, that might derive from influence from the Zoroastrian belief in this cosmic battle between light and dark within, within that religion. So that, that's important. Um, also, just Persian Empire is another one of these massive multi-ethnic empires that like, had a government that uh, ruled its people by creating a bureaucracy. They divided up their government into what were called satrapies uh, or satraps. Um, and that division of the government, um, that division of the government is just one of these effective ways to rule a massive multi-ethnic empire. The Persians also built roads. Everybody builds roads. Persians built a road. Theirs was called the Royal Road um, to more easily trade within their state and more easily move armies. Nothing else about the Persians that you would need to know. Yeah. Um, ah, one more thing about the Persians. Um, <laughs> the Persians are the guys that like, when, remember when the Jews are taken into the Babylonian captivity? Um, and that's when we said very, at the very beginning of the year that that's when the Jewish faith becomes portable. Their temple got destroyed. They codify the Torah, those first five books of the Bible. They write them down now. Um, and they, 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 they unify it and codify it. Now you can take the Torah wherever you go. It is the Persians and that, that Persian king Cyrus the Great that lets the Jews stay or go back Rebuild their temple if they want. That is like a, a tolerant notion. Like local people can do what they want as long as you keep the peace and pay your taxes. Questions? No, yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, Stop! No, go ahead. About the, uh, the Mongols. Yeah. I know they conquered China, but then they conquered like a couple other, other, a couple other places. If you were a dynasty in the 1200s, if you were a state in the 1200s that was getting conquered, it was because of the Mongols. So the Mongols are going to create the largest land empire in human history. It's gonna stretch from, uh, from East Asia in China, including Korea, and push all the way across to uh, almost the Mediterranean Sea. So yeah, absolutely. The Abbasid Caliphate, their, their capital city of Baghdad was sieged by the Mongols. The Mongols surrounded it. The Mongols broke down the walls. The Mongols destroyed Baghdad. So uh, the Mongols also uh, destroyed many Russian cities uh, that, that weren't willing to pay tribute. That's why in the earliest history of Russia, we talked about Novgorod being an important Russian city. But the princes of Novgorod didn't want to pay the Mongols tribute. So they're gone. And the princes of Moscow were willing to pay that tribute. So they survived. They survived. And, and, and eventually, once the Mongols weakened, people are tired of paying tribute. You only Tribute. This is something that seems to come up a lot, and sometimes kids are a little foggy in it. Tribute is like a like a school bully, um, and the school bully will go up to the kid, the, the weaker kid, and say, "Give me your lunch money, or I'm gonna pound you." I'm thinking, anybody read Calvin and Hobbes? All right. So think think of the, the bully in Calvin and Hobbes. Good stuff. Um, so I'm gonna pound you if you don't give me give me your lunch money, right? And so you gotta give your lunch money. You gotta give your lunch money. I know about this well. I've got a lot of experience here. Uh, you give your lunch money, you give your lunch money, until some point where maybe you hit a growth spurt or two, and all of a sudden, you're as big as the bully. And then you can tell the bully, yeah, not giving you the lunch money anymore. Um, and so, so that's what happens with, with the tributary states, the Mongols. All of these states are giving the Mongols tribute, giving the Mongols tribute, until Ivan III, Ivan III in Russia, a prince of Moscow, says, you know what, we're done. The Mongols are weak now. We'll, we'll fight them. We, we don't have to just give in to them. And so 
Ivan the Third leads, leads an army against the Mongols, and they drive the Mongols away from Moscow. Um, so you pay tribute to a more powerful state until they're not more powerful anymore, and then you break free. Yeah? So how did they weaken, like, initially? Just time! Like, why does anybody weaken? So remember, under the earliest years of the Mongol Empire, it was all united into one unified empire. Then Genghis Khan dies, and the empire gets divided into four khanates, right? And that would be like the Yuan Dynasty, the Golden Horde that moves up into Russia, one called the Il Khanate in the Middle East, and then one called the Jagadai. You don't need to know that. Um, but uh, it's divided, right? So now you don't have quite as unified. But it's still a massive multi-ethnic empire. It's huge with a lot of different kinds of people, and they don't all want to be dominated by the Mongols. And they're just waiting for that opening. And within, within about 100 years, that opening starts to present itself. One big factor, remember the, uh, the, the bubonic plague. Remember the Black Plague. The Black Plague is a European thing in the 1350s, but it actually starts in Asia. And as that starts to move its way across Asia, everything is going to be weaker in its path, including areas that the Mongols control. Question. Yes. Hey, so one of the LEQs was like technology from 1450 to like 17. Mm -hmm. 1450. Yeah. Yeah. Can you go over like some of the key like? Uh, Gunpowder technology is huge. Uh, so tech question about technology 1450 to 1750. Gunpowder technology. Remember we talked about the gunpowder empires, uh, the Ottoman, the Safavid, and the Mughal empires. These are these are three empires that are going to grow and conquer territory because they've got gunpowder technology, cannons, and their enemies don't. We also see um, the Spanish and the Portuguese on their caravels, armed with broad, what we call broadside cannons, to put guns on these ships. And that's going to allow them to take control over markets. But then the other technology and shipping, like a magnetic compass, the astrolabe, um, new maps, uh, these are all going to be important and effective technologies. And then we can remember um, not always the newest technologies, but sometimes, you know, a technology is new if it's new to you. Remember when the Europeans make their way to the Americas? The, the Aztec or the Inca, they didn't have metallurgy. They didn't work with metal weapons. They didn't have steel. Um, they didn't have iron weapons. And so when the Spaniards arrive with those kinds of technologies, there's nothing that the, the Native Americans can do to, to resist that, even with their, their larger numbers. What else we got? Yes, ma'am. So for the split of Rome, what are some like significant um, similarities and differences between the two sides? Okay, so all you need to know about the split in Rome is that was a method to maintain political control. That was a way that the Romans tried to solve their problem of having this massive multi-ethnic empire that was getting to be a bit unmanageable, right? So they divided it in half. Um, you've got the Western Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. You've got a capital in Rome for the West. You've got a capital in what eventually becomes known as the city of Constantinople in the East. Which of those two sides was by far the wealthier? Constantinople. The Byzantine side, the Constantinople side. Um, excellent. The Eastern side. We want to remember for most of what, like, don't be, don't think like today, the Western world, Western Europe, United States is like the wealthier part of the world. Not for long, but it is. Um, don't get bogged down by that. In, for most of history, the, the wealthiest part of the world was the middle, was China, certainly in the East, but then the Middle East where a lot of that Asian trade is going through. So we're talking Eastern Mediterranean, that's where the money is. That's why they're gonna continue to last. The Western Roman Empire is going to ultimately get invaded by outsiders, Germanic tribes and whatnot. The Eastern Roman Empire could better defend itself because they've got more resources in the East. And that's why the Byzantine Empire, which is really the Roman Empire, is going to continue for another thousand years. The other most important difference that you're going to get is after the fall of the city of Rome, we're going to go in, and this would be period three, the 600 to 1450, Western Europe is going to go through its feudal age where there isn't a strong centralized government, where there's like local landlords running the show. Some landlords become more powerful than others. Some landlords defeat other landlords and might even be eventually known as a king, but it's a feudal society. Whereas the Eastern Roman Empire, which we now call the Byzantine Empire, continues with a strong centralized government, all right? You also want to recommend or recognize because the Byzantine Empire continues as the Roman Emperor or Empire, 
the emperor of the Byzantine, maybe a guy like Justinian, he's always at the top. He never kind of, he never went away. He's always there being dominant. And he takes precedence over the church. It is the emperor of the Byzantine that chooses the church leadership. Whereas in the Western Roman Empire, in the city of Rome, there's no emperor anymore. So the pope becomes like maybe the most important religious and political figure in Western Europe. And so in the East, we have that idea of Cesaro papism, the Caesar and the Pope in one, religious leadership and political leadership in one. In the West, you have a Pope, the religious leadership. I know some crazy is happening out there. Um, religious leadership, and then separate, you have a bunch of political leaders. But guess what? The political leaders better make sure they're cool with the Pope. And if they're not cool with the Pope, it's going to be a hard time because the Pope controls the priests and the religion is central to everybody in, in Western Europe. Um, we're going to hop to names we haven't talked to. Yes? Um, this is kind of just about the test, but like when you're doing like a DBQ or STQ or something and you have like maybe two answers that like one you're not really sure, yeah, are yeah. you better off putting it anyway? Or um, we, the way that these are graded is you get graded for what you do well, you don't mark, get marked down for what you do poorly. So if you were talking about, like one of those LEQs that you looked at last week was about the effects of the Colombian exchange on people of, of Afro-Eurasia. And if you say one of the effects was a, a weakening of some African kingdoms because of the populations taken away in the transatlantic slave trade, good. Another effect is the growth in populations with the introduction of new foods like the potato. Good. A third effect is, is the arrival of alien spacecraft that bring new technology that human beings were never even aware of before. That's wrong. You made that up. As a reader, we just overlook that. We, we ignore what is wrong. We give you credit for what is right. And that's why it's so important. If you're not sure of something, you can, and you got 10 or 15 minutes left, chuck it against the wall and maybe you're gonna get credit for it. Maybe, maybe you get that reader at the end of the week. Dude has already read 900 long essay questions on the same exact question. His eyeballs have started to liquefy. They're dripping down his face. He is just done. And he's like, all right, I don't know. This kid wrote four pages. Ugh. Okay, I'll do the four pages. Whatever. Four pages. Whatever. Four pages of crap, maybe. But I'll throw him, throw him a bone. So write something. Always write. Don't. The only guarantee you're going to have is if you write nothing, you're going to get no points. So try to write something, even if you're not 100% sure. And that's why I encourage you on the DBQ, try to handle all seven documents, even if you're not 100% sure of the meaning on one of them. For the sourcing on the DBQ, do it with four. Even though you really only need three, do it with four, just in case you screw one up. You don't lose points for screwing things up. You only get points for doing things well. Um, another question over here, yeah. So like, how do they keep track of like what you're screwing up? And like, <coughs> like, I feel like in my English exam, like I had a lot of like stuff that I messed up on, but I had a lot of stuff that I was like hitting on. But like, cause I I uh, sourced like six documents instead of like four. So, so time out really quick here. Sometimes I, I think there's a miss like sourcing a document. You don't get credit to say, like, let's, let's say um, uh, we had a, a DBQ that was about how wonderful a person you are, right? And we got seven different sources. And three of them were, were documents talking about how horrible you are. And four of them were documents talking about how great you are, right? Well, if one of those sources that talked about how great you are was from your mother, you can't say this for sourcing. Source three came from my mom, and, um, and leave it at that. <laughs> you can't, just, you can't just explain where the source comes from, who said it. You have to give that next statement, it's gonna be another sentence, that's going to ex explain something like, because it came from my mother, she's like ordered to like me. She has to think I'm special. Even, even if I'm not all that special, your mom is supposed to love you. So it, it is, it is logical that my mother would be saying such nice things about me, which maybe makes that document. Like if you were doing real research, you can still use that information, but you would want to find other sources to corroborate, right, to support that. So um, 
how do the readers grade it? They've got checklists. They check boxes. They, they kind of keep track by checking boxes. That's why it's so important to put your document numbers up in your roadmap. Because your reader will start checking those boxes, many of them, will start checking those boxes even up in your introduction before they get to your body. They shouldn't. They shouldn't be checking those boxes until they're reading about it in your body, but a lot of them are going to. So, so please, make sure you include the documents up in your introduction. Just document numbers, like whatever your main argument is, and then the two or three documents that support that argument. You're gonna have those numbers up in your intro. It helps the readers grade. Okay, what else we got? We had a question, Mark? Yeah, so like, I was looking at the Cold War, so what, is there like one single event that ended it, or was it just done? The, the, there's a lot of debates, and for AP World, you don't have to worry too much about anything except for the idea that the Soviet Union couldn't afford the nuclear arms race anymore. The Soviet Union couldn't keep up with the American economy. Also, there was a big push for not only Soviet citizens, but also people of Eastern Europe that were kind of controlled by the Soviet Union. Think Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania. There's a push by those people to have more political freedom. And, and the Soviet Union was just not willing to, to fight to hold on to their empire anymore. And so it just kind of <laughs> fell apart. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, going back to like period two, I think. Yeah. When Ju Judaism was being developed, uh, not developed, like go. Actually, let me restart. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh, that's on YouTube now. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Got your face uh, yeah. in there too. I will. I will edit that out. I will edit that out. No, 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 I, I've never don't. edited anything. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Give me a question. Anyway, so um, I know that the Jews they were con conquered by like the Assyrians and like the Babylonians and stuff like that. Um, right. That is correct, right? Jews were conquered by Assyrians and Babylonians. And then so wrong. yeah, and, and this is um, yes. So that that's an event known as the Jewish diaspora. Um, and, and we've got a couple different, remember a diaspora? This is a word you need to know. It's a scattering or spreading of people. There's really three big ones in history. A Jewish diaspora, a, a merchant diaspora uh, uh, issue with like Muslims and Jewish communities as merchants who are kind of, that, that's why Islam is in Indonesia. Indonesia is the biggest Islamic country in the world population wise because of original merchant diaspora communities. Um, so the Jewish diaspora begins in the, like the 700s BCE when part of the Jewish kingdom was conquered by, uh, or the, the northern Jewish kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians. You don't have to have that, that that's too deep for AP world. Then later, the Neo-Babylonians or Chaldeans conquered the, the southern Jewish kingdom. That's when the Jews had the Babylonian exile. There's a third Jewish diaspora with the Romans in 70 CE when the Romans got tired of, of protests and, and riots by the Jewish population in Jerusalem and they smashed them. They destroyed the Jewish temple and that's when the Jews had like their final Jewish diaspora scattering throughout the world. That's why like when Muhammad created Islam and he was, or when Islam was born I should say, um, Muhammad had contact with Jews in Arabia. Why were there Jews in Arabia? Because of the diaspora. They spread out. And so there were, there were Jewish populations in every Middle Eastern country until the birth of Israel in the 1940s. Um, okay, what else we got? Answer a couple more questions and then, or, yes ma'am. What were like key points of the Roman Empire? I, uh, key points of the Roman Empire. I, I guess one thing you might want to recognize with the Roman Empire is it, it goes in stages. I, I, let me say two things. When we think of Greece, what kind of government do we think of? Democracy. We think of democracy, but we should stop thinking of democracy when we think of Greece. When we think of Greece, we should think of it like a decentralized region made up of a number of city-states, where some of them, at some time, like Athens, practiced democracy, while others were dictatorships or monarchies, authoritarian states, or whatever. All right, Rome, Rome, has, goes through its own stages of different government, and it, and it goes. In the beginning, Rome is a kingdom. In the, Rome is a kingdom. And then, um, into the, uh, the, the 6th and the 5th century, it moves into what's known as a republic, the Roman Republic. And that's 5th uh, or 6th century BCE. 
and the Republic is going to last until the birth of the Empire, led by a guy named Augustus Caesar. Um, so we just have this kind of trend where uh, there's a king, but eventually the rich aristocrats are like, no, we want more power. So the, the, the king is overthrown, and now the Senate rules, and then eventually another rich, powerful guy named Augustus proclaims himself the first emperor, and the people support him, so now we have the Roman Empire. There's not going to be anything else you're going to be asked about with regard to the Roman Empire beyond that, uh, except for that split and then kind of the, the offshoot of the, the Byzantine Empire. Um, I'm going to take two more questions, and I want to talk about the test real quick. Yeah. Uh, so I've got like this kind of timeline-looking thing of the Renaissance. Yeah. yeah. So what ha what specifically happens in Reformation and the Scientific Revolution? Okay. So I like to, to, to put all these together, and when we think about the Renaissance, I want you to think of that notion of secular humanism, right? Separate from religion, we're going to start thinking about the human world and how we live in it, right? That secular humanism. This is an idea that kind of predated the Renaissance, but it really gets rolling with the Italian Renaissance. And much of the Italian Renaissance, then, is going to be art and some writing that goes away from just purely the religious, kind of changing the way we look at the society that we live in. Um, out of that notion of secular humanism and the people focusing more on the human world comes the Protestant Reformation. And that's where Martin Luther is going to start questioning the role of the Roman Catholic Church, questioning some of the things that the church has been saying, like uh, selling indulgences, things like that, right? Um, then we've got a scientific revolution where many other thinkers are going to start questioning what is like the accepted wisdom about how the universe works. A guy like Nicholas Copernicus saying, no, it's not the, the geocentric solar system, it's heliocentric and we all move around the sun. And Galileo confirming that with his telescope. And then you get the enlightenment, the enlightenment where we're not questioning our faith as much anymore, we're not necessarily questioning science anymore, we're questioning our role in society and how our governments are, are, are being ruled. So really the Renaissance gets us to look at the world a different way. Instead of, think about this, before the Renaissance, most Europeans are looking up to the heavens, right? During and after the Renaissance, many Europeans are looking around them. It doesn't mean they're not religious anymore, but they're looking around them. They're, they're, they're more concerned about this human world that we live in. And many start to question that human world. One invention drives much of this thinking, and that's the printing press. Johannes Gutenberg and the development of the printing press in the 1400s. Now, when Copernicus thinks about a, a, uh, a heliocentric solar system, guess what? It can be printed about, it can be spread, and more people can get their eyes on it. When Gutenberg uh, uh, does his printing press, the first book he makes on it is a Bible. Um, and, uh, and Bibles are going to start becoming cheaper. And Martin Luther wants to start putting Bibles in German. And you can do that more easily with printing presses. And, and when Martin Luther's got his 95 theses, it's not just like one copy written out. We can now have copies of it, and copies of the copies, and copies of the copies of the copies. And it can start to spread like wildfire. When Enlightenment thinkers have their ideas, it's not just them and their buddies talking about it one night. They can print it out and these ideas can spread like wildfire. Literacy rates are gonna rise. People start questioning more. And then eventually, we get revolutions, right? We go right from the, this enlightenment period, and now we're gonna go from like questioning how our governments are acting to actually doing something about it. And we've got four Atlantic revolutions. The American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, the Latin American Revolution. Sweet. I'm gonna call time out really quick.